the church year is coming to a close and we are at Lent talk number 187 for the uh, 12th of November 2023. Before I begin, we're going to we're going to particularly pause on that gospel reading for today for the lectionary passages. But before I do, I just want to tell a story and uh, it's a story that has been deep in my heart because of what's happened the past month and what's going on in our world today. And, and my heart is heavy with this. But General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Allied Commander during World War II, he liberated the concentration camps at the end of the war. And it was under his command that they all were liberated, but he had to visit a few in particular just to see the enormity of the horror of what had happened. And at every one of these concentration camps, he said, I want every photographer you can find. I want everybody who uh, can take pictures to do it. He said, I want to open these concentration camps up to the communities and towns around there. And I want people force them to come in to see the enormity of the horror of what has happened here. And he knew, I mean, just instinctively, the, this great general knew that um, you needed to document and to publicize, if you will, the atrocities, because if we didn't do that, we would easily go, okay, well, you know, let's just move on. Let's just get past this. Uh, let, let's just um, let's forget about this because it's a whole new day. And and um, Eisenhower realized that some things are so hellish that there's no getting past them. You have to remember them. For some, also some things so heavenly that you can't get past. You have to remember them. But some things are just so straight out of the gates of hell that you can't get past them. Like September 11th, like October 7th. Some things you just can't get past. And Christians, we can't get past this one fact. Jesus was a Jew. Now, our passage for today is this story that is really familiar. I have preached on it many times. I've, I've actually written in a book about it, uh, the difference between preparedness. I said you have five uh, scouts be prepared and five strategic planners. No, we're, we're going to, uh, we can plan and turn works according to stay, to stay according to the plan. We're going to stick to the plan. And, and that, But when I was preparing this for you, I got really, wait a minute, there's more here than that. There, there's a lot more here than that. What have I been missing and why have I not seen this before? And let me, let me just give you the thing that brought it to all of a sudden to a head for me. The missing bride. Where's the bride in the story? You got the bridegroom, you got the bridesmaids, but where's the bride? And so I struggle, as I struggle with that and pray about that one question, where's the bride, the missing bride? Um, some things became clear to me. And uh, let me just give you, kind of help you connect the dots of what led me to where I'm going to end up with you today uh, in the, the semiotics of this incredible story of Jesus that he's trying to not just illustrate but animate the kingdom of heaven is like so this is a a story about the kingdom it's not just any story that we could take in abstract it's a story about the kingdom now first of all I don't like the word foolish we we translate in the Bible wrong so every time I see the word foolish I have to look at the original Greek the Greek for both foolish and wise are based on the same root word. 
Frenus. And Frenus literally means mind. So the root, so it's not just foolish and, and wise, but it's foolish mind, wise mind, or good mind, bad mind. So it's a mindfulness thing. And what kind of mind are we having? We got a good mind or a bad mind? We got a foolish mind or a wise mind? What kind of mind do we have? Hmm. So that, that kind of, so I, I, we, we all, all these passages about putting on the mind of Christ. And when we talk about mindfulness, what kind of fullness of mind are we talking about? It's not just any mind, it's Christ's mind. So that, that, that got me going. Um, the, the second, this, this really thing that just hit me like this, where's the bride? The bride in, is missing. Now in Jesus' day, let's get the background right, the context right. Um, the bridesmaids were there to provide lamps for the bridal procession into the bridal chamber. Okay, so uh, context to that. Two fathers got together. They arranged for the marriage of their kids. Uh, part of once that arrangement was made, then the father of the groom, all right, would build on to his compound a, a, a place, a house, if you will, more like an extension, where the, the new newlyweds, the bride and groom, would live as the, you took on the trade of your father. So you followed in his footsteps and you became whatever he was. But in every little compound, there was the thing called the bridal chamber, because you had a lot of kids, and and this is the place that was prepared. So when you did marry, you had a place to go, and it was decorated in flowers and and all sorts of smells. And you now you say, well, so every compound had a bridal chamber, yeah. But it, so what was it when it wasn't a bridal chamber? Well, you could use it as storage. You could use it as just a, a place to escape. Many times it was the guest room. It was the guest room in the compound. You could have one guest room or a couple guest rooms, and one of the guest rooms could be the, the bridal chamber. And hence the confusion where there was no room at the inn. Cataluma literally means guest room, um, a, a place where guests would stay when they came. In this hospitality culture, so you got guests all the time. Uh, and that's why the many compounds had both a bridal chamber and a and a guest room, but sometimes they could be be the same. So you have here a bridal procession um, that would um, lead to where the honeymoon suite was, the bridal the bridal chamber. Now we got to remember too. This is the third thing. I'm just giving you dots to connect. Okay, third dot. The the this is a story about the kingdom of God. Jesus is the kingdom. We've tried to do kingdom without a king. No, the king is the kingdom. Wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. So this is not a story about lamps. It's not a story about weddings. It's not a story about oil. It's a story about the kingdom and the king and putting on the mind of Christ. What does it mean to have your mind fixed on the bridegroom? Okay. Hmm. Number four, I think it's always bothered me. They, they're called wise, these wise virgins. But how can it be wise not to share? Has anybody been bothered by that? That here you got a certain group, five of them, called the wise ones, but they aren't willing to share their excess oil with those who didn't bring enough. How can not sharing be a good thing in the kingdom of God? Um, are we celebrating not sharing? You know, this is, you know, what's, what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, and we're not going to share any less. Not Jesus. Especially when you're not sharing out of the excess. <laughs> you brought more than you needed. You brought an excess. So, it, you know, that's, that's another uh, that's kind of dot number four that I hope that we can connect that uh, helps us. To maybe there's something else going on here other than just preparedness and and planning. Um, number five, oil is a symbol for the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the 
anointed one, oil, means, you know, the anointed one is the Messiah, oil. Now, in Zechariah, there is a, a great detail about the golden lampstand, which, if you've read any of my stuff, you know, is an almond tree. It's not a golden lampstand, it's an almond tree. And it's surrounded, though, by two olive trees. And the olive trees are specified as the two anointed ones, or more literally, the sons and daughters of the oil. Let me just read you Zechariah 4.14. Um, here's the full verse. So he said, these are the two who are anointed, or two who bring oil, or, or even sons and daughters of the oil, which I like, um, to serve the Lord of all the earth, who is the, the shining one. So you got the oil, bears of oil, the daughters of the oil, sons of the oil, uh, to keep the shining one burning, if you will. The star of Bethlehem leads to the shining one, that we may all be shining ones, okay? who make everyone and everything we touch shine and special, just like in the temple, because the temple is now the world. Um, but here's the point. The oil is not about itself. The Holy Spirit does not point to itself. The Holy Spirit points to Christ. It is always the Spirit of Christ. So the oil is not about itself. You don't keep oil going so you can keep oil. You keep oil going so you can burn to light the room. Nor is it the vessel, the lamp, which holds the oil. Uh, it's not about itself. The purpose of the oil, the purpose of the lamp, is to light up the shining one. Make room for the groom. To showcase the groom. To point to the groom. To illumine the groom. Jesus is the shining one. The oil points to Christ. And we focus the story on the oil, on the wicks on the proper trimming of the wicks. Um, the five young women missing their rendezvous with the beloved. But why are they missing it? They're missing it because they're worried about the oil. They're so worried about the oil that they're going to go back and, and, and get the oil that they'd forgotten. No, the, the, the point is not about the oil or the lamps or the wicks. It's all about, are you there when the bridegroom arrives? Running out of oil is not the basic problem in the story. The basic problem in the story is they weren't there. They were off attending to these things that are important, but it's not of ultimate importance. And they've all missed the one thing that was important, and that is the coming of the beloved. They got distracted. They arrived too late. But all of them missed the one thing that was important, the bridegroom. So in some ways, both the wise minds and the bad minds, um, the wise virgins and the bad virgins, uh, are at fault. Uh, the ones who have are not sharing what they have, and the ones who don't have, who are more preoccupied with their lamps than the bridegroom. They're more focused on, oh, I, do I have the right oil, amount of oil? Do I? But it's, the, it's not the lamp. The lamp is there to light the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's all about, it's all about the bridegroom. And everyone is focused on the lamps and the oil and the wicks and not the bridegroom, not Jesus. So in some ways you say, where's the bride? Where's the missing bride? Well, the bride is the church. And we're all part of that church. And we in the church um, are missing our moment because we don't realize that the wedding is our own celebration of our union with Christ, becoming one in Christ. And we got all these things that we're worried about. And so five missed it. Five, even though they didn't get it all right, even though they were at fault too, what they didn't miss was the moment. 
with the bridegroom and they didn't miss being there when the door was opened and they didn't miss the invitation to come in because whatever their faults they still knew that the most important thing was to be there when the bridegroom arrived running out of oil was a problem but it wasn't the ultimate problem the ultimate problem and challenge was you got to get through the door you got to get through the door when it opens get in accept the invitation be there to receive and accept the invitation as the two thieves on either side of jesus on the cross realized they had they had nothing they, they had no lamps no oil no nothing it was all over they had nothing and yet one of them when the door opened said i'm i'm in and the other said i'm not in um it doesn't matter in the end whether you have oil in your lamps or whether you have trimmed your wicks properly or whether you have enough food in the refrigerator or you, whether your house is properly uh, cleaned up um what matters in the end is when the door opens and Jesus is standing there, are you willing, ready, able to, to go in, to go into his arms because he is all that matters. Even if you're empty handed, even if you're a mess, even if your house is impoverished, even if your heart is troubled, when he arrives, don't hide, don't run off, don't scurry trying to get ready for something that you know you're not ready for. Or you feel, feel like you got to make amends before I can show up. No, be there. You are loved just as you are. Jesus, most, what's most important for Jesus is that relationship with you. And that's the power of these words. I do not know you. I do not know you. You haven't been in relationship with me. You've been trimming your wicks and keeping your oil for all sorts of other things, but not for me. So give your simple presence. Give your empty hands. Give your messy house. Give your empty refrigerator. Whatever it is, just give him what you have. Be there and let the king who is the kingdom, turn your home into a kingdom. Let the bridegroom dance with you. Let the feasting begin. Whether you are got enough oil or not, whether your wicks are trimmed or not, whether you got a pretty enough lamp. Um, this is a story about Christ the groom. Directed by the Father, who is inviting us all in. I am the door. Come in. Show up. Even in the middle of the night, in the deepest darkness, when a cry of joy wakes you, are you ready to come in? Now, I grew up singing a song, Give Me Oil in My Lamp, Keep Me Burning. Um, and I, I still love that song. It, it was actually a 19th century song. It came out of the revival holiness movement. Um, a lot of debate about who wrote it. I think Ira D. Stamphill wrote it, but I could be wrong. First published in a Nazarene hymnal, by the way. Uh, so it's been associated with the Nazarenes particularly. But it is a it is a wonderful song, but we think it's about all about the oil. Give me oil in my lamp, give me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, give me burning. Give me burning to the break of day. Yeah. 
so there is this focus on oil and the, each one of the stanzas has a an oil focus you know give me joy in my heart keep me praising and give me love in my heart keep me serving give me peace in my heart keep me loving and and so there the lamp the oil is is joy and the oil is love and the oil is peace yes it's praising and serving and loving but we forget the whole song is about the chorus. Sing, Hosanna. Sing, Hosanna. Sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. It's all about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that we're singing Hosanna to. And that's what the oil is there for. Is to burn in our hearts that we can keep singing Hosannas. And being there when the door opens. To be those moments of opportunity, these moments of witness, those moments of mission. Yes, give me joy in my heart, keep me praising. Give me love in my heart, keep me serving. Give me peace in my heart, keep me loving. Keep me loving till the break of day. But sing Hosanna. Sing Hosanna. Sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. The, the bride is not missing in the story. The bride is the church. And are we singing Hosannas to the King of Kings? That's why there's joy and love and peace and praise and service. It's all about. the king, the groom. It's all about Jesus.